Hi. A few months ago, I created a video about my submission for the Desmos art contest, Desmos Plane, a 3D game that runs entirely within Desmos. In this video, I'll be tearing apart Desmos Plane and allowing you, my viewers, to feast your eyes on its innards, which I will document in excruciating detail. So let's begin. So first of all, what is Desmos Plane anyway? Desmos Plane is a game where you control a glider as it flies through a track. Your goal is to successfully navigate through the track without crashing into it, and, if you're up to the task, to do so in as short a time as possible. It has 8 levels, and I'd say the entire game is about 15 or 30 minutes long, very roughly speaking. If you want to try it out, you can find the link in the description. For the sake of maintaining all of our sanities, I'm not going to attempt to make an expression-by-expression -expression breakdown of Desmos Plane's code. Well, unless you really want me to. I will instead attempt to describe the overall process I used to make Desmos Plane, starting with the rendering engine. 3D rendering in Desmos has been a hobby of mine for quite some time, so the moment I saw the news of the Desmos art contest, I knew I had to make something 3D for it. So I made a 3D rendering engine for Desmos Plane. Here's how it works. The rendering engine starts out with a list of vertices and a list of vertex indices. Here are the vertices of a cube. How do we actually create a cube-like shape with those vertices? Well, we have to connect them together into faces. To be more specific, we'll be connecting them together into triangular faces. How do we do that? Well, that's what the vertex indices are for. Each vertex has a position in the list, called an index. There's the first vertex, the second vertex, the third vertex, etc. The vertex index list tells us the indices of the vertices that make up the actual triangles on the cube. The first triangle's vertices indices are the first three vertex indices in the vertex index list. The second triangle's vertices are defined by the next three indices, and so on and so forth. If vertices at positions 1, 3, and 2 make up a triangle, then we would put 1, 3, and 2 in the vertex index list. Of course, this isn't enough information to actually render anything. We know what triangles from which vertices we want to render, but we can't just render them to the screen because they're still 3D coordinates, while the screen is 2D. There are three things I had to worry about when making Desmos Plane in regards to converting 3D coordinates to 2D coordinates. Translation, rotation, and projection. Translation is just moving around. Generally, when you move around, it appears that the rest of the universe is moving in the opposite direction. So that's quite literally what I did in Desmos Plane. If you move forward, I just move all the 3D meshes backward by subtracting your position from them. Rotation is, well, rotation. I represented rotation in a fairly simplified manner, similar to many first-person games, where the camera is first rotated about the vertical axis, the y-axis in Desmos Plane, which resembles side-to-side -side rotation, and then it's rotated in the side-to-side -side axis, which is the x-axis in Desmos Plane, which resembles up-down rotation. Both of these transformations individually are analogous to a rotation in two dimensions, which is described by this formula. Pause here if you want to use this formula yourself. Projection is the actual thing that converts the 3D coordinates to 2D coordinates, and is the last step of the three. Some would say to use a projection matrix for this or something or the other, but in my case, simply taking the x and y values and dividing by the z value was good enough. Sorry folks, this isn't OpenGL. However, even after all this, we still don't have a proper 3D rendering engine. In what order do we display the triangles? Do we go off of the order in the vertex index list? That can't work. Consider this cube. If the face is currently in front because it's last in the vertex index list, and we suddenly flip it 180 degrees, then that face is erroneously going to appear in front of the one closer to the viewer. We can solve this issue by finding the distance to the center of each face to the camera, and then sorting the faces based on those distances. The first triangles are farthest away, and the last triangles are closest, so that the latter is rendered last. In other words, on top of the other ones, where it's supposed to be. And we're still not done yet. Let's go back to the cube example. Why do we even need to render these faces on the back anyway? They aren't even going to be shown to the user when the cube is oriented this way. Desmos Plane needs as much performance as it can get, and having all these extra faces isn't helping. Getting rid of these faces that face the wrong way is called back face culling. Fortunately, a neat feature built into Blender, the software I use to make the Desmos Plane models, will help us implement it. Blender enforces a certain winding order on polygons. Specifically, all polygons in an exported Blender mesh will be counterclockwise when facing the camera. Thus, if we flip a polygon around so that it's not facing the camera, it'll be clockwise. What this means is that, after projecting, we simply need to filter out any clockwise polygons to call back faces. There's an efficient formula for this in the Stack Overflow thread. Okay, we're finally done implementing the renderer. Haha, <laughs> psych, there's still one last thing. The colors. This is mostly straightforward. It's just a list of red, green, and blue values that vary between 0 and 255. Each RGB triplet becomes the color of a single triangle. Alright, but there's still a few things I haven't addressed in regards to the graphics of Desmos Plane. The first is the lighting. Some faces are darker shades of color than the other. The second is shadows. Some faces are included entirely and are displayed in a much darker color than the others. Here's the thing. None of this stuff was implemented in Desmos. I did have dynamic lighting at one point that was implemented in Desmos, but it was too slow to work with. And given that this is Desmos, speed is something I have to fight for tooth and nail. So I've instead opted to calculate lighting at compile time, a process sometimes called baking. A lighting calculation is simple. 
I take the normal of the face, which is a unit vector perpendicular to it, and then I take the dot product of that with the direction vector of the incoming light. The size of a dot product between two unit vectors is equal to the cosine of the angle between the two vectors. Thus, well-aligned vectors have a dot product close to 1, while ones pointing in opposite directions have a dot product close to negative 1. We want normals pointing opposite to light directions to be bright, so the closer the dot product is to negative 1, the brighter the light. I use this process for both the sun and the multitude of other lights scattered throughout the scene. The casted shadows, on the other hand, were a heck of a lot more difficult, and are probably the technical achievement I am most proud of for this project. See, there's a problem with making casted shadows in Desmos. Desmos polygons are only a single color. I can't just draw part of a polygon light and part of a polygon dark because it's partially occluded by another. It has to be entirely light or dark. To get around this, I did the only thing I could. I split the polygons. How? Well, here's how I did it. I first checked to see whether all vertices in the scene are occluded or not. Occluded vertices are blocked from the light by a triangle and thus are dark, whereas non-occluded ones are not blocked by another triangle and thus are bright. If all the vertices of the triangle are bright, I assume that the entire triangle is bright, color it in as such, and carry on. If all the vertices of a triangle are dark, I assume that the entire triangle is dark, colored in as such, and carry on. Interesting things happen when some vertices are bright and other vertices are dark. There are two possible cases, one bright and two dark, or two bright and one dark. Either way, two of the triangle's edges will convert a dark vertex to a bright vertex. What we're going to do now is examine those edges. Somewhere along each edge, the triangle will switch from being dark to light, or vice versa, in the opposite direction. We're going to find out where that switch occurs. First, cast a ray out of the middle of the edge. Let's say it turns out to not reach the light and is thus dark. Okay, so if the middle is dark and this vertex is dark, then the light-dark transition cannot occur in this interval, leaving us with this interval. Let's check the middle of it to see whether it's light or dark. Let's say it's light. Now since we know that these two vertices are both light, the transition cannot occur here and we've halved our interval yet again. If we repeat this process continually having the interval, we will approach the point of transition between light and dark. Those who have done some programming may be aware that we have just done a binary search over the edge of the triangle. Let's repeat this process for the other light-dark edge. Okay, now we have these two points on the triangle identifying where it switches between light and dark. We can use these to get a decent approximation of the shadow casted onto this triangle by splitting the triangle at the points at which it switches from dark to light. We can accomplish this by subdividing the triangle like so, coloring the regions as described here. Now the skeptical among you may have already identified a number of issues with this method. How can we assume that the shadows will be like this when there could be an undetected light spot at the middle of a triangle? Or an undetected dark spot for that matter? It'll miss all the vertices, and thus the triangle will be assumed to be one solid color. Or what if there are multiple transitions between light and dark on the edge of a triangle? This method will only detect up to a single one of them. These are all valid observations and things I did indeed worry about while developing this algorithm. However, when all was said and done, I realized that while this algorithm certainly wasn't perfect and had noticeable artifacts if I looked hard enough, it was good enough that for the casual viewer it wouldn't matter, all while being fast enough to run in real time in a game. At the end, all of graphics is nothing more than rough approximations of our reality, approximations that must balance realism and speed fitted to their own specific purpose. Oh yeah, speaking of shadow casting, I recently created a much higher quality shadow caster. It's a lot slower and thus impractical for something like Desmos Plane, but it's almost pixel perfect. Check it out if you have the chance. The most important part of this project, however, wasn't the shadow casting, nor was it the collision detection, nor the 3D rendering. The most important part of this project was creating a streamlined workflow. This is because it's a game, meaning you'll have to rapidly iterate on it to produce interesting, balanced, fun-to-play levels and potentially fix bugs. And a long, drawn-out build process, particularly one with manual steps, is antithetical to this kind of rapid iteration. I need to have a fast build process that compiles and loads Desmos Plane with a single tap of a button. Now here's a little secret for how I made Desmos Plane's workflow so fast. I didn't make it in Desmos. Yeah, I lied to you. This isn't a Desmos game. I made it in an entirely different programming language. I'm sorry. Haha, <laughs> I'm just messing with you. This game does run entirely inside of Desmos, and is made entirely out of Desmos expressions that you could type into Desmos manually. If you were a complete lunatic! See, the Desmos expressions for Desmos Plane were not generated via Desmos. They were generated via a compiler that I made myself for this very project. A compiler for a programming language called Lispsmos. Lispsmos is, put simply, a programming language that I made that compiles to a Desmos graph, which I tailor-made for Desmos Plane. I have two versions of it, uh, the newer version implemented in Racket and an older version implemented in TypeScript, the latter of which I used for Desmos Plane. It uses a Lisp-like syntax for ease of implementation and extension. Or, in other words, because I was too lazy and inept to write a proper parser. I won't get into the nitty-gritty details of how it works in this video, but it has a number of advantages over regular Desmos. For one thing, you can see a lot more on the screen at once. There are more lines of code visible at once than there are in Desmos expressions. 
And perhaps most importantly, I can define my own custom macros and whatnot that I can expand to whatever I want in Lisp Plus. Macros I took great advantage of while writing the 1500 lines of code that eventually became Desmos Plane. I have embedded JavaScript, I have 3D model importers, I have macros that expand and macros that expand and yet even more macros that allow me to substitute whatever I want. This post proved to be an insanely valuable tool for creating Desmos plane, because I could express the Desmos expressions I wanted with a single easy-to-read source of truth. No manually copying and pasting heaps of the data around or recreating similar but distinct functions from scratch, all of which I'd have to modify separately in case of an error. As the experts say, keep your code dry. Don't repeat yourself when you're writing code. Lisp's most ensure that this would be the case. Oh, by the way, I'm currently working on a new language that sports several major improvements over Lisp's. Stay tuned for that one. Okay, but Lispdos wasn't the only powerful tool I took advantage of when making this project. Another was Blender, a free open-source 3D graphics program with a whole host of features. The one I was interested in were its 3D modeling and vertex coloring capabilities. Every 3D model in Desmos Plane was modeled and colored in Blender. This was another massive boost to my workflow, because I can't imagine how frustrating it would have been to manually place down vertices and vertex indices to create meshes out of raw Desmos expressions. Seriously, there are easily 5,000 triangles in this game. To color in the triangle, I used Blender's vertex coloring feature. I would then export everything as a .plby file. Because Blender can only export a single file at a time, I made a plugin to export hundreds of them at once, containing every single object in the scene. You might also notice these boxes everywhere. These are the hitboxes for each portion of the level. See, the world in Desmos Plane isn't just one mesh. It's made up of several meshes which are dynamically loaded in and out based on where the player is located. I do this performance reasons because, as you can imagine, it's far faster to render three level segments at a time compared to the 30 or so that make up the entire game. Each box corresponds to the segment of the level. When the player is inside of a given box, the corresponding level section is loaded. Practically everything that could be said to exist in the Desmos Plane world is driven by Blender in this manner. All these cubes are lights. Their size determines their brightness and their vertex colors determine their light color. These pairs of cubes determine the start point of each level along with the direction and speed at which the player moves when they are inserted into the level. A few of the big hitbox cubes are also define the zone in which you are considered to have entered a new level. In other words, if you're inside this cube, the game knows that you've reached level 2. It might seem a bit odd to put all the level elements into Blender like this, but I found it to be far easier to tweak than if I did this all in Desmos. In a way, it's like I'm editing a scene visually, kinda like one would do in Unity, Godot, or another such game engine. So yeah, that was how I made Desmos Plane. It was a long journey and probably the craziest project I made to date. Probably. Anyway, check out the link in the description if you'd like to play it yourself. And as always, thanks for watching.